Right, so news has broken this morning that Labour has suspended backbench MP Geraint Davies following reports of multiple incidents of inappropriate behaviour towards junior female colleagues, exclusively younger. One apparently just 19 at the time, and for context, Davies is 63. The thing is, we we know Davies isn't the only one, so why single him out and not deal with other alleged sex pests? within the Labour Party, because I'll come on to Labour's further known issues in a moment. Now, the accusations against Geraint Davies come from five separate women at this moment in time. And in response, he has said, I do not recognise the allegations. But if I have caused offence to anyone, then I am naturally sorry. The if I have caused offence line really isn't the acceptable response he might think it is. Sexual assault is one of the most underreported, poorly prosecuted crimes going in the UK. And Labour are, of course, right to have taken this action here. But... Have they taken too long about it? Because apparently Davies' behaviour is an open secret in Parliament. Well, that's OK, then. We all know, so no harm done. What? Why has nobody reported it before then? He's been an MP since 1997. One of the women involved claims Davies approached her in a parliamentary bar, only workplace in the UK where you can get pissed whilst on the job. Ridiculous to me. But anyway, she'd had too much to drink, 22 years old as she was at that point, and was approached by Davies, who at that point was 58. He, he kept buying her more drinks, apparently, suggested going back to his flat, took her number instead, and went on to send sexually suggestive messages afterwards. Another woman, the 19-year-old as she then was, was repeatedly approached at conferences, was repeatedly singled out by him, wanting private chats and an invitation to his hotel room. It left her feeling uncomfortable and under pressure. Two other women complained of repeated inappropriate touching, one of whom complained to the party whips about it, but did not raise it as an official complaint because she didn't feel anything would get done. The fifth woman involved here was made to feel uncomfortable with repeated comments about her appearance to the point she left her job as a parliamentary official, blaming the lack of support in Parliament to those who work there due to the behaviour of MP who can seemingly do as they please. These women absolutely should have been supported. And if their allegations are proven true, and I see no reason to doubt them, given there's five of them, given Labour have finally acted here as well to suspend, they have my utmost solidarity, of course. These accusations, to my mind, absolutely constitute sexual harassment. These are multiple accusations of non-consensual contact, ongoing unwelcome touching, repeated targeted contact, verbal and non-verbal, inappropriate comments by a much older man and one in a position of power at that, all ignored apparently for years given the open secret of his apparent behaviour. Getting out given the lack of support is likely the best thing any of these women could have done in which case. Victims of this suffer depression, they suffer anxiety, PTSD, these are serious issues, ongoing health issues that can affect people and blight people for the rest of their lives even. And such behaviour needs to be treated with the utmost seriousness. But as I said at the start, Davies isn't the only one. And as much as Labour are doing the right thing here and now concerning him, what about all the other accusations? There was Birmingham Perry Bar MP Khalid Mahmood, who was taken to tribunal for unfair dismissal after Elena Cohen, a member of his staff who blew the whistle on domestic violence against another of his members of staff, whom she was in a relationship with, and Mahmood was also ignoring anti-Semitic attacks against her, as she just happened to be Jewish as well. She took her complaint straight to Keir Starmer and David Evans, the General Secretary of the Labour Party, and they repeatedly ignored her. Well, she won her tribunal case in the end over being wrongfully sacked by Mahmood, who decided to take the position of protecting the aggressor and not the aggressee, and who has treated the allegations against her with contempt by sacking her instead of addressing them. Starmer continues to pose with Mahmood in photos, hasn't done anything at all about him and the findings against him and his office. Cohen is now on record as saying Starmer is unfit to run the country, and she now plans to stand against Mahmood at the next election after being turned down by the Labour NEC by a Luke Akers led panel, no less, specifically because she blew the whistle to protect other women. Fair play to her. I wish her well. The staff are in question at the centre of this. As far as I know, they're still working for Mahmood. Could be wrong, but I've not heard any different. Starmer's track record for dealing with sexual abuse and sexual assault is not good. It brings up the spectre of his review of the Jimmy Savile case. It brings up the reminder that as Director of Public Prosecutions, he was on the Sentencing Council for Child Sexual Assault. So the laws we uphold on such things, he helped develop sentencing for. Crimes he accused Rishi Sunak of being soft on, yet he developed the punishments. And you just end up with a picture of Starmer as someone who just doesn't take this seriously and is perhaps throwing a backbencher known to behave in an allegedly lewd manner under the bus to show he's not, or attempts to, but still 
there are more cases, and we know there's more. Absana Begum, the left-wing MP for Poplar and Limehouse, another domestic abuse victim, a survivor. She ended up in court accused by her ex-husband of taking housing benefits she wasn't entitled to. The case got thrown out. Starmer was hoping to expel her the minute she was found guilty, though, but it didn't happen, of course. He didn't even offer her a congratulations, however. He was foiled at this point. After she, um, and, and later, when she was standing to be the candidate for Labour again come the next election, or Poplar and Limehouse, her ex-husband struck again, a Labour councillor as he is, to see her triggered. The campaign of abuse, at this, by this point, saw her end up being hospitalised, her own party being the offending factor. She survived the trigger. Starmer has not once offered support or solidarity at any point, lefty as she is. Former Chester MP Chris Matheson threatened sexual violence against a junior staffer and was found guilty thereof in court. Labour hurriedly suspended him as an MP after the guilty verdict, but literally compare this to Geraint Davies here and now. Matheson was a Blairite and a Starmer ally, of course. Davies, much less so. So again, it's one rule for some and another for others. Factionalism at play even when it comes to such as this. Matheson eventually resigned in disgrace, had nothing to do with Labour doing anything, even after the guilty verdict to address his conduct. Just last week, I covered the readmission of Starmerite MP Neil Coyle, of course, a record of racism and sexual harassment there as well. So literally from one week to the next, we've seen Starmer flip-flop even over sexual harassment. Worst of all, though, are the unnamed offenders, still thus far unnamed, it seems, so as to protect their positions, because we know thanks to a Daily Record article from April of last year, that 56 MPs in Parliament across all parties are under investigation by the parliamentary watchdog, the Independent Complaints and Grievances Scheme, the ICGS. And although the record article does not name names, it does state that two of the complaints made relate to two Labour shadow cabinet ministers. In other words, two of Starmer's own front benchers have had allegations made against them, and not once has he acted to remove any of his front bench in relation to any such offence. In other words, we have to assume he is in fact protecting them. Geraint Davies might make Labour look tough on these crimes today, and absolutely should be dealt with appropriately, no argument there. If found guilty of such actions, he has no place of being an MP. But neither, it is clear to see, as several others. And of course, those 56 MPs alluded to, likely coming from all parties as they do, and they have a responsibility to do, uh, deal appropriately with their people as well, and absolutely should. But the truth is, as far as Starmer's Labour is concerned, that this is all for show and carries no real intent when we've seen others readmitted to the party and the anonymity of still more being protected as well. There may in fact, be an even more base explanation for why Davies is being singled out when there are so many others who are not being acted upon or allegations connected with are not being acted upon. And this is a move that is so Keir Starmer that it can't be ignored. And that's around boundary changes again, which I've spoken to, spoken about on a number of videos now. Under the boundary changes coming before the next general election, Geraint Davis's seat of Swansea West is getting abolished, and the MPs to be sharing the spoils of his patch would be Starmerite's Carolyn Harris, Starmer's former personal private secretary, and Tonya Antoniazzi, the shadow minister for Northern Ireland. Now, a cynic might think getting rid of the non-loyalist might be convenient. Read into that what you will, though. I couldn't possibly comment further. Anyway... The Neil Coyle story, I went into more detail as I covered it last week, as I said. So after you've liked, shared and subscribed to the channel, Daily News and Views, that pulls apart those biased mainstream narratives and offer up truth behind some of the headlines as I've done here, you can get the detail on that Coyle story. The man Starmer has just readmitted to the party that apparently he now counts as the high quality candidates that Starmer's after even. And I'll catch you on the next video. Cheers, folks.